you know I'm recording, I'm gonna ask again because I don't have uh, the consent form. So do you guys mind if I record and post it online? Yes, you may record and post online. Okay, perfect. So we're gonna let uh, the students in and over, I'm gonna put the, uh, the little message from CUNY on the chat. So just ignore those. Uh, I'm gonna have to very likely leave at like 2.15, but we have, uh, let me wait, she, isn't she here? Our uh, new um, program specialist, uh, Sasha Ree Moody is going to uh, be here and she's going to also, if you guys need help with the uh, questions or whatnot, she's going to be there. Let me call her. Let's see why she's not here yet. Hello. Uh, uh, you said that you wanted to talk to the students before the event today, right? Yeah, I'm right now. Perfect. I have to head out. I have a meeting with Antonia at 2.15 that I forgot about. So uh, do you mind staying throughout? Actually, no, I can because I'm recording it. So I have to stay here. Ah, then don't, don't worry about it. Okay, I'll let you in once you, uh, uh, I'm just gonna open the room for everyone now. So I'll see you in a bit. Bye. Okay, oh. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, uh, to this joint meeting of the PRISM Junior Scholars and Undergraduate Research Program. Uh, also, this event is open to the whole college and got advertised through uh, many different groups. So uh, welcome, everyone. Uh, I have a couple of announcements. And also, Sashari has a couple of announcements for the Junior Scholars. And then we're going to start. I just wanted to let you know, that, uh, ensure that you know that this event is being recorded. I put the uh, CUNY disclaimer on the chat and I'll post it throughout. So if you don't want your likeness or your voice recorded, remember to not turn on your camera and uh, video, I'm um, sorry, and audio. That said, as I keep been saying all semester, it's really difficult for us on this side to talk to empty black boxes. So we highly encourage you to uh, ask questions and uh, to turn on the camera and to say hello. And uh, uh, also a reminder that is uh, as, a, uh, as a professor at John Jay, it's very difficult to uh, uh, me to remember who you are if I don't see your face. So when you're in class, if you want a letter of recommendation and we don't know who you are, you're not gonna get a letter of recommendation. So make sure that you're turning on your cameras. Uh, Sasha, are you here? Yes, I'm here. Okay, so Sasha, you had a message for the junior scholars. Go ahead. Hi, junior scholars. Your semester is almost over. I know you're probably excited to get to break time. I'm not going to stay very long. I just have a few updates for you guys. So I have sent out a couple of emails to a couple of you guys about your paperwork. So I, some of you have gotten more than one email saying that you're missing something. So let me just explain to you. When you upload your direct deposit form, the one that you get from us PRISM, the one that you download and fill it out. When you're re-uploading that, you're supposed to upload either a void check or a form with a direct deposit form with it from your bank with like your bank logo or something. You can type in if you have, for example, if you have Chase, you can type in Chase um, direct deposit form and fill that out with the information and upload both. So some of you, what you have been doing since I emailed you is that you've just been then uploading just the 
void check or just the direct deposit from your bank, but you need to upload the one that we give you and the one that you got from your bank or with the void check. It needs to be two documents in one, or I'm going to email you guys again. I'll be emailing because a couple of you re-upload and I appreciate that you're trying to get on it as soon as I ask you to, but then you upload it and it's completely wrong. And then I don't want you to have to keep doing it over and over. So just for that, um, most of you have already submitted and I have graded it. You should have gotten your grade on Blackboard from it. Um, for those who haven't replied to my emails that I've sent out telling you you've missed um, something and the documents are missing something, please do that as soon as possible. And so that I can put in, because the longer you take to you do that is the longer to take for you to get your stipend and you don't want that delayed. So um, I'll be sending out another email to you guys, just as a reminder to upload the both documents together. If you upload just one, it'll only be one. If you think because you already give the, the one that we gave you, and now I said, oh, you're missing the void check, and then you upload just the void check, the other one disappears. So you need to do both in one document at the same time. So I hope that makes sense. Feel free to reach out to me if you have questions or concerns. I'm going to put my email in the chat, but I know most of you already have it. And I'll be sending out another email just as a reminder for those who um, need that reminder. If you don't get a reminder from me, that means you're perfectly fine. Okay. So, and thank you guys for all of you that have been like really quick to respond when I said you're missing certain things. I really do appreciate that. Okay. All right. Thank you guys. Thank you, Sashari. Um, so uh, uh, just a couple of reminders for uh, uh, the, uh, uh, on the, the junior scholars. Also, our last event is next Wednesday. Uh, by now, you should have communicated with me if you had issues getting appointments or you don't have classes in the being covered by the Math and Science Research Center. And we have uh, come to a, an agreement on how we're going to handle that. Uh, the, uh, uh, and uh, so it's a, uh, uh, and you should have made an appointment with uh, Sashari or with me if you're a pre-held student to receive advisement. Remember that making that appointment must be before December 15. Uh, documents, because we had those issues with the direct deposit forms, we're gonna extend it to Friday. So you have until Friday to the, uh, uh, upload everything. Uh, then for the undergraduate research students, uh, two things. The first one, stipends were submitted uh, a week and a half ago, and uh, no, about a week ago, uh, is the holiday, so they take a little bit longer. So they should be, uh, uh, they're gonna be uh, started to get processed this week. So I'm hoping that by next week, it will hit, you, uh, hit your account. Again, I apologize for the delay on that. They changed the system on us completely and no one told us. Uh, and then the other thing is for the new students in URP, I'm still trying to figure out how we're gonna do the research training workshop. So stay tuned, just remember that uh, uh, January 24, 25th and 26th, it will be either on those dates or uh, uh, right after those dates. Okay, so today we have uh, three lovely people from Upper West Strategies. This is the company that manages the LifeSci New York City internship program on behalf of the city. And uh, uh, they're gonna talk to you about that program that offers internships in the pharmaceutical and bio biotechnology and biomedical industry in the city of New York. Uh, uh, those internships are paid. And also, if you ask them, they will tell you what are the secrets to get an internship among everyone that competes for it. You just have to ask nicely. Right, Sharon? So uh, I'll leave you with Sharon Kaplan, who is the main person and Upper West Strategies that deals with this program. And uh, she also uh, uh, has two more uh, people from Upper West, uh, Sally Feng and Arlie Cornehal. So go for it. Thank you, Edgardo, and thank you everyone for joining us today. We love um, working with John Jay and we hope to um, place many of you into internships this summer. Um, and actually, as you'll hear, we also have some opportunities during the school year. So those might be possibilities too. Arlie is going to share her screen and um, is going to begin our presentation. And I will talk again later, but I just do wanna say that we will be answering questions at the end of the presentation. So feel free to either write those in the chat um, or um, at the end, you can also raise your hand and ask them out loud. Um, and also I know that Edgardo is uh, recording this. So he will provide you with that recording and we will also provide you with a copy of the slide deck. So if you see any links or anything, um, you'll be able to 
um, see those exact links later on when we share the slide deck with you. So with that, I'm going to pass it along to Arlie. Hi, I'm going to be starting. <laughs> It's okay. Um, so my name is Sally, and I am one of the program coordinators of the LifeSci NYC internship program. And with me today, we have Arlie, and as well as Sharon, who you have just met. And I'm going to start off by talking about the internship program. So the LifeSci NYC internship program is part of the city's initiative to grow the life science industry. It is the component of the New York City Economic Development Corporation's 10 million initiative to grow the life sciences industry in New York City. It offers paid 10 week summer internships for college and graduate students in either science track or business manage management track. And if you think about the city's effort to grow the tech industry starting about 15 years ago, it has really paid off. There are tons of tech programs that have grown up in the city that are thriving. And the city is one of the major players in the tech industry thanks to the city's investments and they want to do the same thing for the life science industry. Um, five years ago, Mayor de Blasio announced a 10 year $1 billion initiative to grow the industry. And in the past five years, it's been really successful. Um, originally, we used to just have summer internship programs, but now we offered um, positions for the fall, winter, and spring internships, as well as part and full-time jobs. And now we are in the fifth year of our program. And we wanted to start off by asking, what does life sciences mean? So feel free to send a message in the chat, or if you like, you could put yourself on unmute and tell us, what do you think life sciences mean? Can also start us off. So in the life sciences, especially right now, um, you might think of pharmaceuticals, especially um, Pfizer. Um, drug manufacture is really important. And we also work with um, a lot of companies that are pharmaceutical and drug development companies. So um, that's where you hear a lot of big companies such as Pfizer. Um, we also have digital health, which is a big and growing industry of the life sciences, especially here in New York City, where we've already boosted up and have a very large thriving tech industry. Um, we have a lot of companies that are focused on digital health. Some of them might even have an app for it. And we are also working with segments of the industry that are a bit outside of the life science industry, but are supporting the life sciences or healthcare. So that can include finance or venture capital or equity research and consulting. Um, so for us here at uh, LifeSci NYC, um, we have two main functions. Um, one is we're recruiting students like all of you on this call, hoping that you all apply to our program, but we're also seeking companies to host these internships. Over the course of four years of the program, we've worked with over 120 companies in a wide range of roles in the life sciences industry, and we're constantly seeking for more companies. We try to make our internship very easy for you. So instead of you having to do a lot of the research to find what life science industries are available in New York City and which one have available internship programs and then apply for it, we're doing all of that for you. All you have to do is you go on our website, apply for a program, and once you've applied, you'll be able to view the list of all the available internships and jobs that we have, and you can apply through our application portal. And a lot of these companies range from a, bank com a big company to a startup, and we also have marketing agencies, financial firms, nonprofit organization, and just a wide range in general. Here you will see that we have divided a lot of these companies up. Um, we have a big section under the pharmaceutical biotech diagnostic section. We also have hospitals, academic medical centers and healthcare, as well as digital health and health tech, as well as nonprofit foundation, the research foundation and finance, marketing, data analysis, consulting. 
We also work with incubators and accelerators, which includes um, a lot of startups. And now Arlie will talk about student eligibility. Thank you, Sally. So our program does offer paid internships. So that means you have to be uh, a W-2 employee. So you have to be either a US citizen, US permanent resident, DACA participant, or international student that when you have a work visa that allows you to work without sponsorship. So that typically, that means you have an F-1 visa and you can apply to programs like OPT or CPT. You have to be an undergraduate or graduate student enrolled in college. So John Jay definitely um, in New York City or New York City resident enrolled elsewhere. We do allow students or those who graduated in the last two years, so since spring 2020, to apply as well. We also have a 3.0 GPA requirement, although if you have lower GPA, you can definitely um, write in the box an application why you have lower GPA than that. And if you're a grad student, you can also include your undergraduate GPA when you apply to our program. So we offer roles, different positions in a variety of different segments in the life science industry uh, that include science and management track roles. Science can include biology, chemistry, biochemistry, biomedical engineering, chemical engineering, as well as tech fields and regulatory fields. And management track can include um, business, marketing, finance, public policy, and supply chain. So you're not limited to one of these fields. You're definitely uh, welcome and encouraged to apply to roles in either of these tracks. So even if you are a bio biomedical engineering student, for example, we have an interest in a business role. Uh, for example, some companies do uh, look for those who have some sort of scientific knowledge in that field, but also has, you know, great communication styles, um, you know, has a business mindset, for example, so you might be a good fit for that role as well. Okay, so here are just a myriad of sample job titles that we have offered in the last couple of years. So you see a similar variety this year, although it might not be the exact same list. Um, and again, we do encourage you to look through the different um, job openings, openings that we do have in our job portal, take a glance at them, see what the requirements are, see what kind of experience you're looking for for each candidate. Even if you don't think you're suited for that particular role, it's a good idea just, just to glance at the job description and see what they, you know, what they require, see maybe in one year, two years, you can add to your experiences as a student or in, in, in the field. Um, this is a useful way if you're, you know, also in your, your beginning of the academic journey. So it's good to see maybe what classes you can take to be a good candidate for particular roles. Uh, and you might see roles that you at first didn't think you were a good fit for, but once you read the actual listing, you'll see that you're actually a good fit for that role. So here is our program timing. So we do place students on a rolling basis. You do have to be in our system and applying to jobs to get those jobs. Um, but we do have a few deadlines. Uh, the first one is actually coming up very soon, it's December 31st. So we do encourage you to apply for that early bird deadline. Final deadline is March 31st for summer applications. For academic year, we also um, you know, get students on a rolling basis. But again, as soon as roles are up, we'll post them and we'll work on filling them right away. Uh, and we'll and definitely, if you uh, are applying to a program right now, you'll see that we already have a variety of summer and fall, winter, spring jobs, internships, uh, but we'll get more of them as well in the spring. And lastly, if you're selected as an intern, we do have a three day boot camp that's at the end of May, around before Memorial Day weekend. It's a great chance to meet other interns um, and just you know get other experience as well. And for fall and spring jobs, the start days will vary depending on the availability of you and your employer. So that they might have looked, for example, for a full-time person or a part-time employee. So it might be flexible, they might allow you to work weekends or evenings, et cetera, but that really depends on your employer as well as you. Okay, so here are just some snapshots of the past years of our program. So as you can see, we did have a virtual bootcamp in the last two years. We're not sure right now if this upcoming um, spring, if the virtual bootcamp, the bootcamp will be in person or virtual. That remains to be seen. 
Um, so you can see that we just have, you know, this is an opportunity for interns to meet, you know, other interns in this field, to get to, you know, be uh, get to listen to panels, to go to workshops on, on networking, for example, and do other hands of things together. Um, we also do offer other mission activities throughout the, throughout the summer. So that might include some networking, um, intern talks, site visits. You can see here a picture that we had one last year. So definitely we hope to continue offering other opportunities for networking uh, with interns as well. So the first step is to apply for our program and that can be at our website at liveside.nyc where you can find the application. And you can either fill out the full application which is required for summer jobs or the BB application which is available for academic year internships and full and part-time internships. Um, and once you've applied through that link, you'll then get a list, um, you get a link through our job portal to see all of our, our, our current openings. So then go through um, all the list, listings that are uh, up in our job portal. You'll see what you have an interest in and what you're qualified for. You'll then submit a personalized cover letter, which we will review later on. That makes a good fit for that. Uh, and after you submit a cover letter, we will then screen it. So that would be me, Sally, and Sharon. We will screen your cover letters and decide who's the best fit for that particular role. Um, after that, We'll send it to companies and companies will ultimately decide who to interview and then who to hire. Okay, as a note, summer applicants are required to do personal statement of information that is not required for non-summer applicants. And if you do the BB application, you can always return it back to draft status to um, then complete the full one. Right. So we will evaluate your application for summer on this on the following. This will include your resume and CV, personal statement, reason for interest in this program, to for desired, an option video of two to three minutes long, academic transcript, find to be unofficial, extracurricular leadership activities, GPA, honors, and or awards, and one or two recommendations. We do we have to emphasize that while we, we hope that you do get a job or internship through our program, you know, it's not guaranteed, you're not guaranteed a placement. So make sure to uh, conduct a job search elsewhere as well. So we do um, encourage you to also apply as early as you can. And then we will evaluate your application and that would be on the following interests in career and life sciences, it's 40 points, person and professional maturity and integrity, uh, 20 points, technical skills assessed or desired to learn, that's 20 points. And for non-summer roles, um, screening for placements will be based on resume and cover letter only. Okay, so now I will go over what makes a strong application or parts of it. So the first thing you will focus, will focus on is your personal statement and not the word personal. You want this to be personal, you want me to make it genuine and specific and concrete. So how we're going to judge exactly how interested you are in being part of our program. It doesn't mean from the effort you put into the statement itself, but as well as what you say there as well. So you can discuss here any relevant experiences or qualifications you might have and what you would like to learn from an internship or what your career goals are as well. You can demonstrate that your interest, that your interest, interest is genuine by discussing perhaps how your interest came about. Perhaps it was because you had a personal experience in your childhood or in high school, maybe it was because in college that inspired you um, to be in this field. Uh, perhaps you encountered a health crisis or you witnessed a health crisis in your family or, or, in, or your community. So whatever it is, definitely share that with us if you are open to it. We want to hear you know, who you are and why you have an interest in this, in this industry. You can also talk about the work you want to do, uh, but don't feel like you have to be limited to a particular function. Um, in this industry. So if you want to, for example, um, get a wet lab kind of role, you can have to mention that as well. But if you are open to business roles, you can also mention that as well. And lastly, uh, we do ask for at least 100 words. So definitely uh, make sure to, don't keep it short. Definitely, you know, tell us who you are and answer all parts of the questions. Don't be vague or abstract as well. We also have an optional video, um, and this is not required, but we do ha we have found that those who have submitted a video, uh, it gives them a greater chance 
of success in being placed in an internship and demonstrates, you know, an increased level of effort and interest in our program. You know, you can do it on your phone, on a laptop, anything fancy, sort of two, two or three minutes long. And you can, again, talk about your, what you ever talked about in personal statements. So that can be, again, your interest in this industry, your qualifications for different roles, uh, perhaps, you know, anything that you already mentioned can also apply to this video as well. And, you know, a lot of the employers are going to be looking at so many applications. So this can be a great chance for you to kind of stand out uh, amongst all these um, probably qualified and, you know, a number of different candidates that are applying to the same job. So also emphasize uh, your interest in life sciences industry. So even if you're not, uh, you know, if you are a science major, biology major, that's super great. Definitely talk about your interests and your, and, your, and your major. But if you're not, if you're a business major or another kind of major, you know, talk about how your particular skill set can, you know, be a benefit to the industry and, and how you feel like, you know, that, that could, um, you could support that industry through your own skill set. The next bullet point here is really important for any kind of application that you might, you know, apply for. So here, just check, you know, for no, for spelling, grammar, and formatting mistakes. Uh, you don't want to give any higher managers an excuse to screen you out. Um, so definitely, again, check your spelling, grammar, and formatting. When you write your personal statement, you can do that outside of our portal because we don't offer a spell check or even grammar check. So you, feel like you, you could probably use, for example, like Grammarly or other um, different platforms that will provide that kind of um, check for you. You could also ask someone else to read it out for you or to prove it for you because you might you know, be reading it over and over again. You might miss something. Uh, also, you can read it out loud. That could also help you just to kind of screen for any mistakes you might have made. And we'll also go over resume in a little bit later on. But that should be up to date. I'm also going to ask you for some recommendations, one or two. Um, and keep in mind, as soon as you plug your references email address into our system, into our platform, it is going to trigger an automated email to that person. So make sure to ask for permission in advance to add them as a reference. Uh, and, for, and, for you, and for whoever you add as a reference, you can also make them a cheat sheet. And that can include, um, you know, your copy of your resume, it can include any relevant course, or for example, for any process you, you've had. It just gives them an easy way to kind of reference, you know, your interests in this industry, your experiences, um, you know, how you know them, and this will give them a great way to write something great about you in our, in our platform. You can go to a professor to ask for reference in your relevant field, or even, even if it's not a relevant field, that's fine as well. Uh, just, it can be anyone who can reference, uh, who can speak to your work ethic, your motivation, and your character. And that can include an employer, coaches, or other mentors and advisors. Anybody but a close friend or family member. And again, give them a cheat sheet and that will definitely help them uh, just to be readily able to write that reference for you. Okay, so now I'm gonna pass it on to Sharon who will go over how to make a strong resume and cover letter. Thank you, Arlie. Um, so I imagine that all of you have a resume already. Um, but we're going to give you some tips to make it as effective as possible in helping you to um, catch a hiring manager's eye and hopefully find a really great uh, summer or other opportunity. Um, what we have here is a link. And again, we will share this presentation with you later so you can, you can get this exact link then. I know it's really long and I don't expect any of you to copy it down right now. But this is an article from LinkedIn um, that gives some really great tips on how to really construct um, and write those bullet points on your resume about each of the um, particular jobs or um, work that you're highlighting on your resume. It will teach you to make those really action oriented. Um, in short, what you wanna do when you put those bullet points on your resume is you wanna talk about, um, first of all, what did you do? What was the, the purpose of the perhaps research project or the main, um, duties of the job that you're writing about. And then how did you do it? Um, talk about the various methodologies that you used, um, any particular lab procedures or computer languages. 
um, you know, whatever kinds of methods you used, and then why did you do this? So you want to talk about any analysis you did and what were the final results and what did you accomplish? Um, and you can read a little bit more about how to do that in this article. Um, some other things that you want to make sure on your resume, you want to make sure that you have a skills section. Um, often when a hiring manager looks at a resume, they are probably going to spend less than one minute just glancing over it. They're probably looking for some key things to see if you have those um, absolutely um, inarguable skills that you have to have to do the particular job. And they want to just be able to check those boxes to decide if you're going to be in the, the pile for further screening or the pile for a no thank you. Um, so some of the kinds of things you might put in that skills section may include um, lab procedures that you know how to do and analytical skills that you understand um, and equipment that you know how to use. So that could include, for let's say a lab could include PCR, gel electrophoresis or mouse models, for instance. Um, software is also really great. Of course, if you're a computer scientist and we do um, place many of those and have a great need for those, um, of course, then you're gonna have a lot of detail in terms of the, the kinds of software and coding where you have an ability, but even for others, um, Software is a good thing to put on there because for almost any job these days, it's um, helpful to know. And some jobs even say, you know, we want you to be able to use the Google suite or the Microsoft suite. So it's good to put those things on your resume. Um, definitely mention any programming languages in which you're proficient and any actual spoken languages. Um, and Certainly put any languages that you're fluent in, and you can even indicate that, that it's native or fluent. Um, it's okay to put languages in which you're a beginner as well, but I do urge you to indicate that on your resume because you don't want to um, you know, put Spanish on your resume if it's something maybe you have one year's Spanish instruction. So you're sort of, you're a beginner Spanish speaker or student. Um, you don't want that interviewer to say, oh, look, I have somebody who's fluent in Spanish and all of a sudden start speaking to you in Spanish and you get all flustered. So, if, you know, as long as you're honest and you say Spanish, you know, beginner level or something, then that's great. Um, do highlight any research experience you have in your relevant field. Um, that is going to help convince a hiring manager that you know how to apply the skills in a hands-on way. You haven't just seen it in a classroom. Now, let's say you haven't had a prior internship or outside research experience, that's okay. What you wanna do is put a project section on your resume. And there you're gonna pick a couple of the, the biggest and um, most advanced class projects that you've done. And you're gonna do those bullet points like I discussed a minute ago. And that is also going to help a hiring manager see that you know how to apply your skills um, in a practical way. And they may not even pay that much attention to whether it's in the classroom or in an outside project, but you will have shown that you have used the skills that are in your skills listing. Um, definitely include any leadership roles you've held in clubs or organizations. Um, almost any job, whether it's a science job or a tech job or a business job, is going to be looking for somebody who has strong communication skills. And you can often demonstrate that you have these kind of skills by listing some of the roles that you have played or um, jobs that you've performed for an extracurricular club or team. Um, you know, maybe you ran an event, maybe you were secretary of a club, maybe you took on social media for an organization you belong to. These are all really relevant skills um, that can make you more attractive to an organization that's looking to hire you and show that you can be professional and that you can show leadership and um, take on a project yourself. Um, so do list those extracurricular activities. Of course, list any awards or honors that you've received. A GPA is not a required element of a resume. Now, if your GPA is something that you are super proud of and you think it's, it's really a highlight, it's really impressive, then definitely put it on your resume. But if you feel like your actual um, skills and experience maybe speak a little bit more impressively about what you're able to contribute than your GPA, then don't put it on there. Nobody's gonna miss it. Nobody's gonna wonder where it is. Your resume should be a compilation of your strongest attributes. And if your GPA isn't one of your strongest attributes, leave it off. Um, and then finally, Arlie mentioned this earlier, but proofreading is so, so important. 
when you are applying for a job, you're looking for that business owner or business manager to trust you with what their business is. And that's taking a big leap for them. So if they see that you have um, shown professionalism and accuracy and attention to detail in your application materials, then they're going to be more confident that you're going to do the same thing when you are doing work for their company. Um, we always tell applicants that, um, you know, often people will say that they are detail oriented or very organized and they might put that on their resume or in a cover letter. And honestly, it's not that meaningful. Anybody can say that they are those things, but if you demonstrate, if you show that you are those things, then it's going to be much more compelling. So make your resume perfect. You wanna make sure that first of all, everything is up to date. A resume is a live document. You don't do it once and forget about it for a year or more. You update it whenever there's any change. So um, for instance, in your education, don't say that you are a sophomore. Instead, you know, put your, your institution, um, John Jay College, and put your expected graduation date and your expected degree. So you're expecting uh, BS in biology or whatever it is, you know, spring 2022. That, and that way, that is less likely to get out of date. Obviously, you'll need to change it when you graduate, um, but not so much before. Um, you also want to make sure that your formatting is perfect. So you want to make sure that all your margins are lined up, that your um, headings are all in the same font and the same boldness, that um, your bullet points line up, that your line spacing is consistent. Um, and when you send in a resume for a job, always make sure that you send it as a PDF. Um, sometimes people send us, for instance, a Word doc, and we can see because they leave on the sort of um, the tracking, the tracking changes um, when they get it to somebody else to proofread and they can see somebody, we can see somebody else's suggestions of um, things that you need to do on your resume. So it's always a great idea to send it as a PDF and nobody can see any of those editing marks when they look at it. Um, and of course, ask other people to look at it and take advantage of the experts at your career services department here at John Jay. Um, because they are really good at what they do. They've looked at thousands of resumes and they will be able to look at your resume and immediately tell you if there's anything you can do to make it more effective. Um, and now I'm going to talk about the, the final piece in the job hunting package, and that is your cover letter. So when you apply to our program, you will have done the online application and you will have done the resume and you're gonna submit all that and we're gonna have it all on file. So you don't have to keep submitting that information over and over. And though we do invite you to send us a new copy of your resume anytime that you do feel like you need to update it and we're happy to update your application that way. The cover letter is where you're going to be making a case that you are the perfect candidate for a specific company and a specific role. Um, so if you, while we allow, um, we allow applicants to apply for as many opportunities as they like from our listings, that's one of the advantages of our program. However, you do need to take the time to personalize each cover letter. Um, when we see um, that a particular student has applied for multiple opportunities and they're submitting substantially the same cover letter for everyone, it's a safe bet that those cover letters don't make a very good case for why that candidate is a, is a good candidate for a particular role. It's kind of just a rehashing of, you know, this was my education, this is my skills, which is great, but we see those things on your resume and your cover letter is the place to do that um, where you're speaking to a particular company to tell them I'm the one you wanna hire because I am the perfect fit. Um, you can't say the same thing to convince them that you're a perfect fit for various different opportunities, so here's how we recommend that you make your cover letter perfect for each company. Um, you want to, first of all, express your interest in the position and company. Start it with a formal salutation. So dear hiring manager, because generally you won't know the name of the person you're writing to um, for our opportunities. Um, so, you know, I am writing to apply for the business development internship at X company. Um, and then you're gonna introduce yourself. So state your major, your academic year and the university that you attend. And then we're gonna get into the part that is 
really important in personalizing the individual letter. So before you write the cover letter, you wanna make sure that you have read the company's job description really closely. Um, read what they say about themselves and read what they say about the role and its responsibilities and read what they say are the required skills that you must have. Also take a look at the company's website to make sure that you understand the full scope of the company and you see what they're trying to get across about themselves. So then in this part of your cover letter, having done this basic research, you wanna emphasize how the company's mission and work is relevant to your career goals and your interests. Um, this will show that you've done your research on the company um, and convince them that you have a genuine interest and you're not just applying to 20 million internships to make sure that you have a summer job. Um, then you're gonna have a section where you're gonna really talk about what you can bring to that job that is perfect for the situation. So you wanna highlight your applicable skills and research. So you're gonna give examples from your personal experience of how you fulfill those things that were listed in the job description. So you don't need to mention everything that's on your resume here. You wanna mention those things that particularly show that you have the skills um, to do what they're asking for in the job description um, and give an example of a time maybe that you did that in the past. Um, if, whether it's internships or work experience in the past or whether it's class projects or um, individual research and independent work that you've done. Um, and you can talk about that for a few sentences. And again, this is where you can demonstrate that if they say they want somebody who's detail-oriented, you can say, I'm a very detail-oriented person. For example, when I was working on such and such of a project, I had to be very, very careful to not make any mistakes in this particular area. And that way you can give an example that shows that you have demonstrated that you're detail-oriented. Finally, um, you're going to wrap up the letter by summarizing why you're a good fit for the position and then restate your interest and thank the hiring manager for their consideration and then sign off with a formal um, closing. So sincerely or best regards and your name. Um, it's not a bad idea to put your contact information in the cover letter, but at least for our program, they will also have it on your resume. Um, so it's not absolutely required. And um, now we are gonna go on and give you a few helpful links. And again, we will share this uh, presentation with you later. So you'll be able to um, get those links then. But we have a link to our website here where you can find more information on our program. We also invite you all to join our LifeSci NYC internship program meetup, um, which is a group rerun where we um, we'll be offering various career panels of interest to those who are considering a career in the life sciences. Um, and we will also maybe bring your uh, other events of interest to your attention. And we'll also um, highlight new job listings. Now that does not include summer internships because we only show our summer internship listings to those who complete our full summer application. But for any full-time jobs or academic year internships, we will um, send a, he a heads up to those who are subscribed to our meetup to let you know that we've posted that new role. Um, we have a link here for office hours. Um, Arlie and Sally are both available to meet with students individually. Um, and that can be if you have a question as you're working on your application, if you need some advice on your resume or a cover letter or need to do some practice or an upcoming interview, um, anything that you have questions about that's relevant to our program, you're welcome to make an appointment um, at that link and you can have a 10 minute one-on-one -on -one appointment. And then finally, um, if, I, I know that um, Edgardo is taping this conversation, so you'll have access to his recording, but we've also placed um, recordings of our presentation um, from similar occasions on YouTube and we have those available there as well. Um, I now want to open up the floor to questions. We can um, start with those that are in the chat. And then I also invite you to raise your hand and ask a question out loud. We'd love to see your face and hear your voice. So that is, is very welcome as well. So let me see what we have in the chat. I know I saw a question about computer science somewhere.
Hi, the question about computer science was, are there a lot of computer science and technology related internships provided by this program? And it's from Chris and Jacobs. Oh, okay. So yes, that is a major area where we find a need from our um, corporate hosts. Um, there are many, many companies that need um, students with computer science expertise. And we definitely strongly encourage those of you in the tech fields to apply to the program. And I see a question. Can we also put the minor in the resume? And I'll let Sally take that question. Yes, um, you could put your minor as part of your resume. And especially if it, you think that's something that will help with your application, you can also highlight that in your cover letter too. Pretty much like Sally just said, you can put whatever you want on your resume or your application. You can put a cartoon, you can put a recipe for pot pie, you can put your favorite, the order your favorite cookies. Think about it. What do the people that are going to be reading your resume need to know about you to make sure that you are the perfect person for this uh, job? That's what you want to make sure is there. Yeah, some people actually do put links on their resume, especially, I would say, um, for computer scientists, um, we often find that hiring managers are asking for um, a link to their to people's GitHub, which um, I'm not a computer scientist, so I don't really understand the things that are on there, but I know that they are very relevant if you are looking for a job in that field, and that's a great thing to have, and you can just put that link right on your resume. Yeah. A, great, a great tool provided to all of John Jay students to share our writing samples is using uh, ePortfolio, which is our education uh, uh, electronic portfolio making software. And you just have to log in and create an account. Most of you use it for cl different classes, but you can also create it and have your own personalized website where you have your writing samples online for you to share with future employers. Yes, that's great. And we do also have employers who ask for writing samples sometimes. So please don't hesitate to ask questions. There's no dumb questions and we're happy to, to answer any of them and we, we'd love to hear from you. So uh, 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 Sharon, in your opinion, why should students want to take part in internships in the life science industry in New York City? What's so exciting about it and why uh, it's such a great opportunity for them? Well, I think first of all, as we all know, this is kind of a pivotal moment in the life sciences. Um, you know, the past two years have been consumed by a pandemic. So obviously um, humans have a lot of work to do in terms of um, addressing all sorts of health issues. So you can really make a difference, that's one thing. Another thing is that it's one of the fastest growing industries in New York City right now. Um, so whether or not you are actually a biologist, because many people think that, oh, well that industry is only for, for people who are in biology or science, that's not true. The industry needs people with all different kinds of skills. So if you are a great communicator, Every business needs great communicators. They need people to do marketing and business development and public relations um, and human resources, all kinds of, there are, businesses need people who do all kinds of things. And while every business might have their specialty area that is what their product represents, there's also a back office that the company can't function without that. So even if you can do one of those skills, um, and even better, if you understand the science and have a, an interest and a passion for it, um, you can still may find that you prefer those um, back office time kinds of functions. Um, you know, we work with many, let's say, um, venture capital or um, investment bank types of companies where they might be specializing in biotech. Um, but they don't actually necessarily always want business majors for those kinds of of roles, they want people who really understand the science because they need to be able to look at all the new products that are coming onto the market and the new ideas and evaluate them um, with a scientific mindset to decide if they would be a good investment. So I, I encourage you when you look at our job listings to, as Arlie said, read them all, even if you think something might not be of interest to you, 
what you might find is that you'll read through a job description and it's not probably a job that you even knew existed, um, that anybody has that job or that there's a need for that, but you'll read it and you'll all of a sudden think about it and say, wow, that sounds really interesting. I think I would really love to do that. And even if you're not currently qualified for that role, read the job description, see what they're looking for. And especially if you're in the earlier years of your academic journey, you still have the chance to kind of shape what you want to do. Um, and all of you can also think about graduate school if you're in the later years, but look at what they're asking for in that job description. And if you find that, you know, they're asking for a certain kind of data analysis or, um, you know, a genetics course or whatever it is, you'll know what kind of um, additional skills and knowledge you need to go out and seek and acquire for yourself so that you could qualify for that kind of job in the future. Um, we have a question from Samuel. Um, he asked if a New York City residency is required, particularly for those of us like uh, uh, me and Samuel that uh, commute from New Jersey. Arlie, do you wanna take that one? Yes, so you have to be either an undergrad or graduate student enrolled in New York City school, so like John Jay, or be a New York City resident. So you, if you are enrolled in John Jay, you definitely do are eligible for our program. Oh, that's excellent. Okay, so I have a question. Uh, let's say that I'm looking for internships and I only find maybe one or two that I am completely and definitely interested in. What would be the value potentially of applying and getting an, a different, in, applying to and potentially getting an, an internship that not, might not meet all, ev, all of my requirements? Is there value on that? I absolutely think there's value in that. Um, I mean, when you are, you, I would say most of you are definitely, you know, at the launching stage of your career. You're not too far into it, I would think. And having a broad range of experience is so useful going forward. Um, you never know what, even if you have a very clear idea, you want to become a dentist, for instance, you know, and you have a very clear idea what you want to do. When you decide you want to be a dentist, you might not have thought about the fact that there are so many other skills and experience that you will need in order to be successful. You might need, no, we need to know how to run a business. Um, you will need to know how to uh, deal with people on a one-to-one -one basis. And even if an internship or a job is not exactly what you had in mind, you're going to pick up skills that are going to be transferable and that are going to make you um, have broader appeal and ability to take on new things as they come up. And the other thing is, is that an internship, um, you never know, you might take the one that, that you thought was exactly right for you. Sometimes, once in a while, the most valuable thing you can get out of an internship is to find out what you don't want to do. Um, so be open. Uh, the chances of finding exactly what anybody is looking for, you know, whether you're looking for an apartment or you're looking for a job, you always have to make compromises. You never find everything, single thing to check off on your list. Um, but that doesn't mean it's not going to end up being a great experience. Do we have any questions uh, from the audience anymore? No, and I couldn't agree uh, uh, more with you, Sharon. Uh, uh, a lot of the times when what we believe we're going to like or we're going to excel in, sometimes it doesn't really meet our expectations when we are faced with the reality. So by experiencing as much as we can and going through as many opportunities as possible, you can sort out, okay, I thought I was going to really enjoy this, but you know what? No, that was my experience in high school with... Uh, 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 my mother, because, you know, my family, there were three professions. You were either a physician, an engineer, or an, a lawyer. That's it. Mm -hmm. So uh, uh, in high school, I volunteered in a hospital, and a physician. I was working in the ER answering phone. A physician took a liking to me, and I, okay, well, let me show you how to do sutures. I fainted. I have absolutely no shame in a minute that I fainted. It's like, ew, there's blood and tissue, and ew, no, 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 no. That's the moment I said, yeah, medicine is not for me. And I could have gone through college and then applying to medical school and then realizing it that late that that was not for me. So by getting experience, sometimes experience and stuff that we don't like, we can uh, 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 really improve our chances of figuring out what is the right job for you. 
Yeah, because probably you're not going to end up taking a job where you don't like anything about it. But let's say some people really think that they want to go into academic research and then they um, you know, do a research job. Maybe they get their PhD even and they decide, you know what, I'm so really passionate about this material, but it's not my favorite thing to be on the lab bench all the time. And they realize that they might be better off, you know, working in an investment firm that's evaluating other companies that are doing research, or they might be better off in a communications role where they're communicating science for other audiences. Um, but you learn these things about yourself by doing things. And so none of your experiences are a waste. Um, they're just helping you on your journey. They're just part of your pathway. And none of it's a waste. It's all valuable. And you've contributed. And you've also gained something from it. But it helps you figure out where your not next stop on the way should be. Okay, well, everyone, I posted uh, links to how to get make appointments at the, our, our, the John G. Career Center if you want some help with your resume. I also posted links uh, for to great advice on how to work on your resume and your uh, personal statement from the Purdue Online Writing uh, Lab and also from other organizations. Uh, and uh, I also posted the links that Sharon and uh, Sally and Arlie shared with us throughout the uh, meeting today. Uh, I will send out to the uh, junior scholars and URP the, uh, 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 the slides from today. And I will have the recording and I will post it on YouTube. So if you want to see it or you want the link, let me know. And uh, finally, uh, I highly recommend you guys uh, uh, join the LifeSci uh, meetup. That way you get to meet other students across New York that are interested in this, get advice from them, get advice from uh, other lovely people at Upper West Side Strategies, and uh, also learn from alumni that did the program and are still attend the meetups about their experience and how come they were able to successfully apply. Uh, that's it. Our last meeting is going to be next Wednesday when we discuss, uh, uh, we're gonna welcome the Boston University Forensic Anthropology Program. That will be the last opportunity for uh, the junior scholars to make up their uh, minimum workshop requirements and for URP to learn about potential pro uh, uh, postgraduate programs in forensic anthropology, which a lot of you have asked me about and I have absolutely nothing. To, uh, I don't know anything about it. And as I've told a few of you, turns out that when I lived in Boston, my upstairs neighbor was, is now the director of that program. So it was a good connection that I made there. Uh, that's it, have a great week. Good luck in finals and final presentations, etc. cetera. And uh, please remember to uh, junior scholars submit the paperwork before Friday, fix uh, 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 whatever uh, Sasha identified that you needed to fix. And for URP, stay in touch with me and the, uh, uh, please let me know when you start receiving the stipends on your bank accounts. For the junior scholars, the stipends will arrive between January 1st and 15th, we're hoping. Have a good one, everyone. Thank you.